So, it's been a year, huh? Let's remove what's happened in reality and let's skip this whole part where I was going to talk about it. Let's instead skip to the hyper-reality of pro wrestling, and more specifically Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling. Now, Tokyo Joshi, I feel, has been getting more notoriety in the West and on social media. I see way more fan art of the girls retweeted than usual, more videos on YouTube are dedicated to the promotion, and I have even seen the girls featured on Botchamania. DDT has made an increased effort in making things more friendly for its English audience with the creation of a new show, that's JPW, adding English commentary to its bigger shows, and making an English Twitter account. There's still a long way to go, I feel I need to remake my getting into TJPW video just because of the remade site. But baby steps, and given the time of year, it's the thought that counts. Because I originally <laughs> read this script back in December. I don't want to attribute all this to a single event, but you know, it was probably Ito's doing. But it was the hard work of the rest of the girls that kept the first exposed fans around. Now while all this was good, there are still some hurdles the promotion had to overcome. We are still in the middle of a pandemic unfortunately, so Tokyo Joshi has had to struggle with limited capacity shows and having difficulty with travelling. God, I miss streamers. Add on to that the departure of Shiori Senna, who I was sure was due to win the tag titles, and the rookie with so much potential, Marai Mayumi. But the biggest loss is the retirement of Hakusan, the owner and runner of the unofficial DDT and Tokyo Joshi Twitter account. Hakusan has worked behind the scenes and provided live translations to shows and backstage promos. Had it not been for his hard work, my videos would be far lesser or even not exist at all. Shine on, you crazy diamond. Tokyo Joshi has done a good job course correcting storylines to still keep things compelling, and while there are yet more releases on the horizon, let's forget about all that for now and get back to talking about the good. <laughs> I will be going through my favourite matches and moments of this year. They're in chronological order, so as to not make favourites. The qualifications for these matches are that they needed to take place in a Tokyo Joshi promotion, or else things would get complicated. As for moments, I lifted that restriction to mean any moment I enjoyed that had a Tokyo Joshi wrestler in them. While great matches are a reason to watch the promotion, the moments are there to give a taste of the personality that Tokyo Joshi has over the others. So, without further ado, let's get started. To kick off, we have the tag match of Hikari Noah and Shori Senna versus Bishkigun. Leading up to this match, Bishkigun had been picking on Senna in tag matches until finally Hikari, Senna's friend, stepped in to team with her and even the score. The match is filled with great moments, Hikari and Sakasama showing disrespect for one another, that is then escalated into some aggressive offense which makes the match feel more real and shows Hikari's determination to protect her friend. Mei-san's spots with her tray are scattered throughout the match and build anticipation, from Hikari stealing the plate to Mei-san's eventual deployment of the trap. Mei-san also displays the great chemistry she has with Sakisama. Their opposite statures mixed with Sakisama's precision strikes and Mei-san's frantic offense help to show each other's strengths. I dare say Mei-san is the best partner Sakisama has had. And I don't mean that in just ability, although that's there. The fact that she is an unknown element and not a previously converted established roster member, making the match exciting as a Bishkigun victory is not guaranteed. Finally, there is Senna who does a tremendous job of keeping up with the more experienced members of the match. She does play the role of the weak factor of the match, but she does so well garnering sympathy. But she is also able to show off her skills and almost make you believe that she can pull it off. Azure Kong, Joshi legend, well known around the world for her accomplishments, so it's good to see that she can have fun as well, and joins Raku for the Goodnight Express. Granted, it looks more painful when she does it. Even though this is a singles match with no belt on the line, this match can't help but feel big. Ito and Miu had been teaming off and on in the 2020 period, and hadn't had a big singles match since Ito went for the title in 2019. The match gets going straight away and keeps the pace throughout. It is fast and hard hitting. And Ito shows how far she has come, being able to keep up with the ace of Tokyo Joshi. Countering many of Miu's moves in the early parts of the match, and her quick pin attempt transitions impress. Also the psychology is on point, Ito hitting DDTs so that her headbutt smash is more effective, and focusing on Miu's back so the Boston Crab and Ito Deluxe hurt more. Both Miu's and Ito's facial expressions are on point, not just when getting hit, but also during retaliations of moves. My favourite spot has to be the running charge attacks. It's so smooth and I could watch it over and over.
When Miyu takes control from there, she shows why she is the ace and delivers the best skull kick so far. My only complaint with this match is that it's too short. I could have watched these girls go for another 15-20 minutes. So, AEW has this thing where they attach a camera to a ring post to get unique coverage of the match. And DDT is known for taking ideas elsewhere and doing them, how can I say this nicely, on the cheap? Which is no problem, it's worked well for them before and adding the DDT flavour to things can be fun and unique. But when you strap a tripod to the corner with duct tape and call it a day, you're gonna get problems. Every time a wrestler hits the turnbuckle, the camera shakes wildly so you can't see anything. I love it and think it's really funny. After their singles match, Ito and Miyu would make their tag team official of 1 to million for the Max Hart tournament. This is a rematch of a few years ago of another tag tournament, which Masao and Shoko coming out on top. Miyu and Ito are able to show off some new team moves to prove that they can work together as a team. And this is also shown with Miyu and Ito having the majority of the offense, Masao and Shoko just barely able to keep up. That's not to say that they are pushovers, Shoko is able to display her quick speed and flips, and whilst Masao does employ a trick to blind Miyu, the rest of the match is free of any cheating. Even though Masao and Shoko had shown that they are fine with using these to win. This makes the match more competitive and a well-deserved win for whoever gets it. The constant protection and countering of moves by teammates shows the bond and trust the tag partners have with each other, and that is what ultimately wins the match. I love the up-up girls and I love how they open every show with a song, but I really miss when there were multiple performances per show, from the Ito Respect Army and the like. Fortunately, at the second pay-per-view show, we get to see Rika, Princess of Princess Champion, sing her entrance song, all with Shin, Ultra Shoko and Hyper Masao cheering along in the audience. It's just a really heartwarming moment, is adorable, and is an example of why I love the promotion. A rematch from earlier in the year with Mio and Ito being victorious, but this time it's to decide the winners of the Max Heart tournament. Miyu and Saikisama are trying to one-up each other in terms of striking in the match, while Mei-san is off doing her goblin thing. The match really feels like Miyu vs Bishkigun, Miyu being too focused on beating Bishkigun as she never has done so before. Ito was the one to get the win last time. She is so focused she neglects her teamwork with Ito, until Ito has to finally step in to remind Miyu it's a tag match. But it's already too late at that point, Miyu has overexerted herself and Bishkigun had isolated Miyu so she could not tag out even if she wanted to. Miyu tries to fight off Sakisama's assault, but again without Ito she can't take on both of Bishkigun, and Mei-san is there to assist Sakisama. Bishkigun showing off the importance of teamwork, which is what the tournament was all about. The cherry on the cake being Miyu screaming in frustration as the trophies are handed to Bishkigun. Don't have much to say, in fact the clip is shorter than me explaining it, I just love Ito's expression when she realised she's been looking at the wrong camera. Very relatable. This is an important match for both competitors, for Rika is to get her first win for her first ever Princess of Princess Championship title reign. For Miyu, she has to prove that her generation of talent can be at the main event scene. Miyu may be less experienced, but she is stronger, and this is shown throughout the match. The two know each other so well from tag teaming that many moves are countered and reversed. Rika continues to show how dangerous she is by constantly attacking Miyu's legs, which Miyu capitalises on by selling perfectly. For the majority of the match, Rika has the upper hand showing how she is the dominating champion, while Miyu shows great determination by weathering the storm and mounting comebacks. The second win from Miyu puts Rika on the defensive, making her need to quickly end the match or be overwhelmed. The conclusion being a win for Rika, but Miyu proving herself at the same time. Chris is tall, he's like 5.5 feet or something, and Neko is really small, she's about 3 inches. I had hoped there would be some way to compare their sizes, fortunately my prayers were answered at the That's JPW show where they stand side by side. I would have really liked an image though of Neko in frame but Chris's head is cut off for the whole interview. A triple tag match that features two of the most well regarded tag teams and also the unproven B-Stars. With three teams involved, the match is constantly moving. This makes the action feel super chaotic, with wrestlers flying in and out to do their moves and show off their strengths. 
The highlights of the match being the Shoko and Yuka matchup. The chaos, however, allows the underdogs to sneak in a win for a surprising end result. This setting them up for a tag title match later in the year. So, my friends have a running wrestling joke that when Undertaker had his biker gimmick, he should have had a little red sidecar for Kane. I think it's a funny visual. Unfortunately, Shoko Masao did an attempt by having a bicycle with a cardboard sidecar, and it almost makes it to the ring before breaking apart. As a fan of death matches, Hikari has been given a golden opportunity. The fact that a match like this is happening in Tokyo Joshi shows how much the company is progressing and the risks and new ideas they are willing to take. Long gone are the days where wrestlers would need to adhere to the idle rules, with the opponent of Arena Yamashita adds a layer of credibility to the match, which helps offset the use of more non-traditional items like glow sticks and idle CDs. Throughout the match, Hikari takes so much punishment, the table spot being a highlight of the match. It is clear that she is outclassed by Rina as they go through the traditional hardcore spots, but when Hikari is able to get revenge, it's cathartic. This match proved that the hardcore match experiment was a clear success and opened the doors to other hardcore matches to take place. Sure, I can see Ito sing all the time, but think about this in context. Here we have a Japanese idol performing her song entirely in Japanese on an American pay-per-view. Pre-show, whatever. And not just at some small indie show, it's one of the biggest pay-per-views for the number two company in America, and I think that's incredible. After returning from AEW, Ito brought a lot of new eyes to Tokyo Joshi, so she not only has the pressure of winning a championship match, but also not to let down any fans who followed her to this promotion. The match features super aggressive wrestling from both Rika and Ito, with the match having spots that take place outside the ring, this despite Ito being a cute idol and Rika being a pure white dragon. Both have two different styles of wrestling that clash and complement each other well. The story of who will break first, Ito's legs or Rika's back, and whether Ito's head is stronger than Rika's hips. And Ito and Rika are known for their intense facial expressions, and so combined the match becomes that much more engaging. Right here, if Ito got Rika in the Ito Deluxe she probably would have won, but Rika is able to antagonise her and keep the match going. The following sleeper hole spot makes for memorable moments, and big spots like the Dragon Twister Fate off a of Brett's rope show the girls are giving it everything they have. By match end, these two legitimise Tokyo Joshi to a brand new audience. Find someone who reacts to you the same way Rika reacts to pulling a Mizuki card out of an envelope. This match is the culmination of Hikari's year, from tag matches with her retired tag partner Shiori Senna, to the singles matches with Rina Yamashita and Miyu Yamashita. Even though she did not win those big matches, she was able to show that she is capable of having great matches and thus a title opportunity. The two were able to put on a great match under not ideal conditions, with there being no audience to play off due to restrictions. Kamiyu and Hikari were able to rise above it and not let it detract from the show. Also, because of no audience, there is no need for rest spots, so the two fly through this match, keeping it exciting. With Hikari using chairs to allude to her bid to become the hardcore queen, she takes some nasty looking chair shots. This being Hikari and Kamiyu's second match for the International Championship, the two build on spots that were featured in that match, culminating in the top rope Blizzard Suplex. This match ended Kamiyu's title reign, but cemented her as a great asset for Tokyo Joshi, and this is her best match so far and for Hikari, a great match for a well-earned prize that she had been fighting for for so long. Tokyo Joshi do these online autograph signings where if you buy a portrait or a cheeky on their store, you can get it signed and the wrestlers will try to say your name. It's all very casual and fun. And guess who doesn't do casual and fun? The Bishigun autograph signings are like performance art. There's classical music, regal outfits, Sakisama signs autographs with a rose, there is a new maid that appears increasing the Sakisama lore. It's good background noise, I think, as the two shoot the shit as they sign. And then Mei san tries to read Sakisama's handwriting while they thank the fans. You really don't get to see this side of Sakisama often, more casual and dare I say, jovial without being sadistic. An interesting detail for this match is it features newly crowned international champion Hikari Noah versus former Princess of Princess champion Rika Tatsumi, both having a devil-may-care attitude of willing to do anything to beat their opponent. 
With Hikari's flexibility, it allows Rika to apply some very nasty looking holds, and the closing moments of the match have a back and forth momentum shift, making you think the result of the match could go either way, with multiple near falls and close calls. The cherry on top is the blizzard suplex that is broken because Rika is too close to the ropes. I will add all these together, one of my favourite long running spots is watching Miyu do the giant swing, and seeing all the innovative ways she can perform the move. My two most favourites are when Miyu spins both Shoko and Mizuki at once, which has been confirmed to have never been done before. But also the Mizuki solo spin, whereby Miyu spins so hard and so fast I felt like they were going to take flight. Poor Mizuki. And I know we are one step closer to Miyu giant swinging Azure Kong, which I expect will look like that scene from King Kong vs Godzilla. Rika and Masao have a lot of history between each other, and with that comes respect. So much so that even though this is a Hyper Masao match, there are no tricks employed. I love the Princess Cup for not only giving us unconventional matchups, but also ones that don't take place regular enough. Misao has been searching for her true strength ever since leaving Bishigun, and Rika seems to be the best person to draw it out of her. When Rika hits the top rope hip attack, I thought it was over, like it had been before, but Misao kicks out and the match builds from there. Misao keeps fighting, hitting an I am a hero to the outside, and a draping Hyper Gotham crash, both women pushing each other to the absolute edge. The finish being a quick pin counter, making it more of a fluke. And that a real match and conclusion is still to be decided. We don't see special entrances all that often in Tokyo Joe, which is a shame, so when they do show up, it's a real treat. And Bishigun are always so elegant, so graceful, so distinguished. Well, it fits her character, so I don't know if this was on purpose or not. Quick mention to the Bishigun entrance in Chocobro, which is amazing in its own way, due to the contrast. The next match has quite a built history to it. Disregarding the Ito Respect Army fallout, the two met in last year's semi-finals with Mizuki beating Ito by busting out the Whirling Candy for the first time. Added on to the fact that Ito has never beaten Mizuki, and Mizuki is going for her third Princess Cup victory. One on one you have a very tense match indeed. The two fight aggressively, not because they don't have a respect for one another, but because they do. To not give their all would be insulting. Before the match, Ito suffered a face injury earlier in the tournament, and Mizuki is efficient in exploiting it. The big moves add an extra layer of danger. Mizuki finally tapping to the Ito looks is such a relief, and all the emotions are finally able to come out, bringing this chapter of Mizuki and Ito's story to a close. So, I'm a big fan of things like Puro Wave and other videos similar. I've had ideas to make videos like these, but didn't have the time. One of the songs I would have used would definitely be Kakate Koyo. I think it is really fitting for the promotion, Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling agreed with me and beat me to the punch. While the match could not be included because of my own rules, I'll include the promo. It's a hype song that goes with the video package that not only outlines the history of Yuka and Miyu, but the whole company with quick shots of wrestlers that may not be in the company but were a huge influence on the promotion. Which is good as this would be representing and showing off the whole company to new eyes that were there for DDT and Noah and I get a few glimpses of Kana B-roll footage, and I have never seen that before. And this is also evidence that DDT held onto all the footage from the early days of Tokyo Joshi, so they have no excuse not to upload it. Give me my Snake People arc, damn it! Here we are at the biggest match of the year, the championship title match at Wrestle Princess 2, the conclusion of Ito and Miyu's story arc that started at the beginning of the year. With Miyu the current champ after beating the opponent, Ito couldn't and Ito clawing her way back through the Princess Cup to face the person who has beaten her in every singles match they had up to this point. However, Ito has been developing tactics to beat Miyu's offense, as not only have the two faced each other before, but the two have been teaming together throughout 2021. It really shows that this was the match the company was building to throughout the whole year. After the KO victory in their last singles match, you feel this match could end at any time. And with big spots like the Tornado DDT to the outside and an Avalanche AA, it shows how far the two are willing to go to win. Ito not only counters the Crash Rabbit Heat, but also the Skull Kick, showing Ito's growth as a wrestler and that she is a smart wrestler that learns from previous matches. 
By the end of the match, it's the same result as Ito's debut, with the same opponent. But this time, the reason for the tears are different. Oh, you thought we were done with the big match of the year? Nah, we got one more. The four-way tag match. There is a lot of time devoted to the entrances, four minutes of it in fact. Thankfully, all the songs are bangers with the best tag teams in the company. You may think this is a throwaway match with nothing on the line, but it builds on top of previous Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling lore, like no one trusting Misao and Shoko after the three-way tag match, and Rika's obsession with Mizuki. The tone between the last match and this one is the exact opposite. You have the big match that is heartfelt and ends in tears, and this one that brings a smile to my face. Which is one of the reasons I love Tokyo Joshi so much. The match is designed to show off the strengths of all the tag teams. The speed of Maji Rabi, the strength of the Bakaratsu sisters, the speciality of Daydream, and the unique offense of Shoko and Masao. Again, the highlight is Shoko and Yuka, and matches like these are a great showcase for new viewers, as it exposes them to a great number of the top talent of Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling. And also, most importantly, the tone. So, that's the year in review, and all in all, it was a great year. So many good matches took place during a hard time, and I feel like things are starting to get back to normal. And there is much to look forward to indeed, with the potential of travel opening up so the girls can go to other promotions more freely, and the possibility of new talent from other countries popping in for a cup of coffee or longer. And with more big events like Grand Princess announced, it shows that Tokyo Joshi's growth has not stopped and it should be a promotion everyone is keeping their eye on. That's all from me, and I hope we have a good 2022. Ta-ta.